In one revolutionary stand of defiance, the National Assembly is born. It will be a communion of voices from around the country, a parliamentary body enacting the people's will. But wresting power from the king would not be so easy as signing a simple proclamation. All of these early victories that take place at Versailles are largely paper victories, and they have no teeth to back them up. And the fear that it happens that it takes over the deputies at Versailles as we approach July, mid-July is that the king is gathering his forces to disperse them, to overthrow them. By early July, 30,000 of the king's troops are taking positions around Paris. To defend themselves, the people form a new national guard. Rioters raid Paris's armories and make away with over 28,000 muskets. The only thing missing is gunpowder, and the people know just where to get it. In the center of Paris, there looms a massive stone dungeon, notorious as a symbol of feudal rule, the Bastille. The prison houses the city's stores of gunpowder and is legendary as a den of torture and unspeakable deaths. The Bastille had been the great symbol of royal despotism, the great symbol of the kings of France running beyond the just limits of their own power, a symbol of horror for the people of France. Amidst the rioting, there is a stunning outrage. Louis fires his finance minister, the people's beloved Jacques Necker, seen as too sympathetic to the masses. Hours after Necker is fired, word reaches Paris that their man on the inside has been ousted. There is nothing left but revolt. On July 14th, crowds band together identifying themselves with a small cockade, red and blue for the colors of Paris, separated by white, the color of the House of Bourbon. The tricolor is born. From the feverish crowd, a voice cries out, to the Bastille. Attacking the Bastille means that the people of Paris are saying, you cannot get rid of the new National Assembly. The people are acting, they're arming themselves, and they're basically saying, we take the side of the revolution. At the sight of the approaching mob, the governor of the Bastille, Bernard de Launay, attempts to lock down the prison. He mounts a hopeless defense and the marauders storm the fortress and tear into the guards with knives and pikes. Finally, Delaunay surrenders, but the enraged mob engulfs him, dragging him through the streets. The jeering horde kicks and stabs at him until he shouts, let me die. The crowd eagerly obliges. He is stabbed and shot, and a revolutionary tradition is born. His severed head is paraded on a pike. Well, the deputies in the National Assembly do not immediately condemn this act of violence. In fact, they accept it. And it was this acceptance of uh, popular violence that, in some people's view, uh, created a pattern that was to have catastrophic consequences for uh, the unfolding of the revolution. With the smoke still clearing over the Bastille, Louis XVI returns from a hunting trip. In his diary, under the date July 14, 1789, he writes, Nothing. A reference to his unsuccessful hunt. An aide interrupts and breaks the news of the riots and the fall of the Bastille. Louis XVI asks, Is it a revolt? No, sire, he replies. It is a revolution. Victory at the Bastille unleashes the irrepressible torrent of revolution. The people had defied their king and won. There would be no turning back. As a symbol of the defeat of tyranny, the people, men, women, and children, dig in with bare hands and tear the Bastille apart, brick by feudal brick. They are beginning to dismantle the past itself. 
the French went about the process of tearing down the Bastille as quickly as they could. In the absence of powerful explosives, this was done very painstakingly, but with a tremendous amount of vigor. And the bricks were given away, sold as emblems of the demolition of despotism. The energy of the streets invigorates the National Assembly. A charter is penned within days called the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Under this daring new document, archaic class distinctions are to be abolished and all men considered truly equal. The Declaration of the Rights of Man was a declaration promulgated by the National Assembly which said in its text that the sovereignty belongs to the people, belongs to the nation. The king is nowhere mentioned in this document. Therefore, by issuing this document, the Assembly was effectively seizing power for itself. With the new National Assembly as their voice, the citizens of France set out to change the very fabric of their world. They demand a constitutional monarchy, equal rights for all men, and justice under reasonable laws. To provide a greater voice for the call of revolution, Robespierre demands increased freedom for the press, long muzzled under the old regime. The resulting free press is spearheaded by l'ami du peuple, the people's friend. A fiery newspaper full of vitriolic rants and provocation. It is the brainchild of a former doctor, Jean-Paul Marat. After a string of unsuccessful careers, Marat found himself living in poverty, for a time finding shelter in the sewers of Paris. It was there he contracted a painful skin disease that now leaves him confined for long periods to a medicinal bath. A bitter and failed Marat finds in the revolution the perfect outlet for his venom. Jean-Paul Marat was just one of these professional malcontents. And unfortunately, revolutions do offer opportunity to professional malcontents. Marat took all of that bile, all of that resentment, and funneled it into a newspaper that became extraordinarily successful, L'Ami du Peuple. Marat was a man possessed of extraordinary anger. You just have to read the pages of his newspaper, The Friend of the People, to see this. In every issue, he displays a complete paranoid mentality. He sees plots everywhere. Everybody is plotting against the revolution, and the answer is very simple for him. The answer is blood. The answer is heads. Marat loathes the monarchy's relentless extravagance, even as poverty grips France, and needs only the slightest rumor to lambast the king and queen in his newspaper. On October 2nd, 1789, his anger boils over. Word reaches Paris that the king has thrown a party at Versailles, that the decadent royals threw the new tricolor flag, symbol of the revolution, to the ground and trampled it underfoot. Marat is enraged. He reports the insult in his paper, just as a new threat breaks. The king has again ordered troops to move into positions around Paris. With the coup at the Bastille still smoldering in the minds of the people, Marat frantically urges them to take action. People of Paris, it's time to open your eyes! Shake yourselves out of your torpor! Wake up! Once more, wake up! October 5th. Dawn breaks to the furious ringing of bells. Women gather near City Hall to protest the shortage of bread. And now fear of the approaching royal troops mixes with anger as news of the king's offensive party circulates through the crowd. Soon, thousands are marching to Versailles, pikes and guns in hand. The women are taking their complaints to the king. The core of the crowd was made up of the famous Poissardes, the fearsome fish ladies of the central markets who were known for their brawny build and their fearlessness. They were equipped with large knives for scaling fish. They were hugely muscular because they carted boxes. Uh, you didn't want to tangle with these ladies. These are women of the poor quarters. These are poor women which are affected by the increased price of bread, by the scarcity of products, who suddenly begin to realize that they must act. It is quite extraordinary how these ordinary women, probably most of them couldn't even write their name. 
suddenly act as the protagonists of the historical process. Inside the palace, word of the approaching crowd of angry women reaches the Queen's chambers. Legend has it that it is at this moment that Marie Antoinette utters the most famous line she never said. Marie Antoinette did not say, let them eat cake. That is a myth. Marie Antoinette, unfortunately, probably never even noticed the poor people of her country long enough to make such a statement. As the mob of women gathers outside the gates, Louis understands that the revolution can no longer be ignored. It is being brought to his front door. He agrees to sign the Declaration of the Rights of Man, yet the crowd continues to grow throughout the night. By morning, 20,000 people are camped outside the royal palace. To close the centuries of distance between the king and his subjects, the angry mass demands that the king and queen move to Paris. Indecisive as ever, Louis is weak to respond. His hesitation would provoke a fury in the crowd and put the lives of the royal family in grave danger. When they don't get instant compliance with what they want, it really looks as if they're going to uh, massacre the queen. A wave of women break into the royal palace screaming for the blood of the queen. They massacre the guards, decapitate them, and impale their heads on pikes. They were like banshees screaming throughout the palace, give me her entrails, give me her head, I want a leg, I want an arm. I think that they had grown so frenzied that if they had encountered her, they probably would have torn her to pieces. Terrified for her life, Marie escapes to Louis' apartments only moments before the women break into her chambers and tear her bed to shreds. King and Queen are now at the mercy of the mob. And what the mob wants is a little attention from their king. The only way the women can be pacified is for the royal family to agree to go to Paris. Because once they're there in Paris, then they can ultimately be made to do what the people of Paris want. They march 60,000 strong, leaving Versailles with carts and wagons overflowing with flour from the king's storehouses flanking the royal carriage all the way to Paris. The king and queen were forced to go back to Paris with the heads of their guards, who had been massacred in the chateau. Their heads had been cut off. This is really a completely unbridled violence. The heads were then made up with makeup and paraded at the head of the cortege, with the king and queen following. The king and queen must make their new home in the Tuileries Palace. They will never see Versailles again. Once the royal family moves to Paris, they are the prisoners of Paris. They know it. Everybody else knows it. There are great limits to what they can do or even dream of doing. They are the prisoners of the capital city, there's no doubt. Versailles is abandoned and the assembly moves to Paris. Power is now with the people. France will have democracy, new laws, and a remarkable and unforgiving form of justice will make its debut on the revolutionary stage the guillotine.